All right. Uh, very good evening to everyone. And of course, when I say evening, I'm just talking about my time zone, but I'm seeing the participants list uh, and uh, we have people from all over the world. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, I have to do, I have to say a special shout out. Uh, I have, I think the participant list and they're very, very familiar names and all that thing. So it's, uh, and I know these people texted me and said they're joining and all. So thank you, especially since they're based in Singapore, it's a late hour as well. Um, at the same time, uh, this is not my show, I, I believe, but uh, it is the show for, uh, it is part of the, we are having a masterclass as part of the Global CBDC Challenge. Now this is, uh, the Global CBDC Challenge is uh, organized by MAS and Tribe Accelerator and, uh, and uh, several other uh, agencies. And uh, we are almost at the tail end, the final few weeks before the finalists uh, make their pitch at the Singapore FinTech Festival. And uh, these classes are conducted to, to, to assist them uh, in improving their product, uh, uh, considering elements that they may not have considered or, or, or even uh, sharpening these elements as well. And so today, uh, in a very interesting topic, a uh, very contemporary topic, and as a matter of fact, a fundamental topic, if you read any literature on CBDC, the AML CFT risks and how we address them. And we are honored to have uh, Radish Singh, uh, a partner, financial crimes compliance leader at Deloitte Southeast Asia, uh, who will be uh, taking us through a, a, a one hour presentation on AML CFT risk and implications on retail CBDC. Uh, in the next hour, we will uh, have a closed door session with just the finalists, but then I, I will speak again there. Uh, but for now, let's not take any more time from Radish. Uh, Radish, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alvinda and uh, the MAS. Uh, thank you very much for having us uh, today. Um, Alvinda has already introduced me. And so good morning and good, uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon to everybody wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us. I'm also joined by my colleagues, uh, Wong Nai Singh, as well as Meishi, uh, Liu Meishi. And we will be you know, uh, joining all of you later at the round table as well. So let's start with the presentation. Um, Right now, we'll start to talk about some of the uh, AML CFT issues uh, for CBDC. Right? Let's let's get on. Then let's go to the next slide. Right? I will I will skip this, but I, I think you know generally we'll cover uh, some of the key takeaways. We'll also look at uh, the potential AML CFT framework, and I say potential because you know this is something that's still will require a lot of consideration, but we will, for today's purposes, work with some key principles. And then we'll look at you know, certain risks that we ought to be thinking about um, when we're going the CBDC way and what are some of the controls right, that we should also be thinking about. We'll then do the Q&A session later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on then to the next slide, please. Mishi, thank you. And next slide. Right, now, in terms of the CBDC, I don't need to really explain that because most of you will be uh, very familiar with that. In fact, you'll know more about it than, than me, especially for those who are participating in the challenge, right? But the point I wanted to make here, the important point really is about, um, is really about uh, the key risks, right? And, and the, in depending on the model that is eventually uh, chosen, uh, the, the, the risks are different, right? If you look at the general principle, uh, when we talk about digital currency today, and I'm, I'm using a very broad uh, brush uh, example here, typically it's always about anonymity, is about uh, you know, the lack of identification and verification, uh, the lack of regulatory oversight or the, the lack of monitoring, yeah, monitoring by issuers, as it were. And, and I know we will come to CDBC, which will be, you know, obviously issued by central banks is slightly different, but I'm just using the same principles because um, that gives us an understanding of the type of issues and controls we need to consider as we go on this journey, right? And also, uh, the, the issue that always, you know, worry uh, practitioners and regulators is the lack of uh, audit trail and traceability. And those are the type of 
issues with the CDBC uh, initiative that we hope uh, will be easily addressed, right? And even in doing so, it also depends on the kind of, uh, on the type of model we chose that we, ch we eventually choose, whether it's token-based or account-based, right? And we'll, we'll also go through some examples later where different jurisdictions have uh, used different, you know, or, or, or maybe thinking, um, uh, to, of different approaches, right? And again, if we go by the token-based approach, then we still are looking at uh, anonymity as an issue, right? Uh, simply because the manner in which it operates. And if we go by account-based, uh, that uh, probably would resolve some of those issues, give us greater traceability. Uh, and at the same time, we it will give us an opportunity to understand and uh, also verify identity of uh, uh, individuals. This is very similar to the current framework that we operate within, right? So if someone has to open a, a bank account, we, we simply have to do the KYC, do the identification and verification. And I'm not really here talking about the regulatory arbitrage where the standards can be different in uh, different jurisdictions, but I'm saying that um, if we, assume that the standards are going to be harmonized and standardized and we are going to go, uh, we are, we are uh, you know, looking at a, a world that is seemingly uh, narrowing the arbitrage where, you know, the adoption of the FETF standards uh, is increasing. So then, uh, you know, that's really where the identification and verification uh, becomes really uh, useful for the purposes of uh, CDBC, right? If we can harmonize and standardize uh, the application of the same, right? Uh, so I think that really um, uh, it is uh, uh, some of the core principles that we work with when it comes to uh, AML uh, and CFT uh, requirements. But of course, we recognize that going uh, with digital currencies today, especially central bank backed ones, uh, is that it certainly would you know enhance uh, efficiency, financial inclusion. We recognize all of that. In fact, as a practitioner, uh, a financial crime compliance practitioner, I'd say that it would also enhance, uh, depending again on the model, if we go the account-based way especially, it will help us significantly in our monitoring um, you know, in our monitoring initiatives as well across the industry, uh, you know, where we can innovate further in that uh, in that aspect, there's greater traceability. There can be various um, um, options that we can think about. Even if you look at sort of, you know, a lot of discussions happening today on industry level utilities uh, to monitor transactions. Uh, you know, I think that those are the type of things that are very achievable uh, if there are. Uh, you know, we're working with it in, within a digital currency uh, framework, right? So that is our, you know, that's our hope as well uh, as we move along, right? We'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you, right? Uh, yeah, I've touched on this, the benefits of, uh, 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 you know, going the CBDC way and what sort of things that we can look at from AML CFT perspective, right? I talked about this earlier. The key thing is about, uh, uh, unmasking uh, anonymity, right? To make sure that there's more traceability, right? If there is a unique account for each individual, uh, there is a unique identity of each, uh, each uh, individual that's hold, holding uh, digital currency uh, or CBDC, then that makes our life that much easier in terms of uh, dealing with the anonymity issue to, to, to a large extent. Um, and of course, uh, the question always with uh, CBDC, uh, the international, you know, principles that we work with, um, you know, have to also be harmonized. The standards have to be harmonized. Uh, and ultimately, I, I think at some point we have to come to an agreement as to whose responsibility and accountability this is. Is it the central bank that's issuing the currency? That'd be quite fun to see, right? Or or, or is it the supervised entities whose responsibility are ultimately, right? Where, do, where, where would the legal and regulatory responsibility sit? I think that's another question uh, to be answered, but uh, we hopefully will get there, uh, you know, at some point. Uh, the other thing is also about allowing, uh, making sure that everything is traceable. There is an order trail. And as you, as you know, today with fiat currencies, with, uh, 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 with the, you know, sort of the, the, the physical form of currency that we're dealing with today, 
uh, one key issue is always about audit trails when it comes to money laundering and uh, you know, counter-terrorist financing, the issue always is about traceability, is about audit trail, right? Simply because of the way, the manner in which a physical cash can, uh, physical cash related transactions can happen, right? Although increasingly over the years now, we are also narrowing down on that, right? Uh, it, it, they, there are, um, other than for very sophisticated uh, criminals, the, the opportunities seem to become uh, less and lesser, right? In terms of uh, how uh, money can be laundered uh, uh, today, but there still there still remains that risk, right? Now, whether digital currencies will um, alleviate all of that when it comes to fraud, money laundering, uh, terrorist financing, um, we hope that it will be significantly lesser, but the risk remains. And therefore, a framework, a AML CFT framework, in my opinion, is still required, a good, and that to a good one, right? So um, the, the, the third point or the third benefit of uh, uh, CBDC certainly is also greater oversight, right, of uh, risks. If uh, the entire, um, you know, uh, if we can move towards uh, uh, full form of digital currency um, and every single individual who holds an, an account uh, has, can easily be identified. Um, and we have uh, audit trail of the movement, uh, movement of the currency, right? Or the funds as it were, that makes our own site ability a lot more easier, right? And we hope that that is one of the benefits that we will see uh, along the way, yeah? Moving on, please, to the next slide, Mishi. Thank you. All right, well, let's talk about some of the key takeaways. And as you know, I think a lot of you, uh, you know, have attended a lot of the master classes, and you've been part of this uh, challenge as well. The uh, here's just a quick snapshot of the initiatives in, uh, of the the CBDC initiatives globally. Right, the green uh, countries depict their CBDC retail initiatives. The ones in blue. Um, is about wholesale initiatives uh, and then the lighter green or the you know sort of that uh, teal I, I don't know what color that is but uh, 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 that uh, shows wholesale and retail initiatives right and uh, the, the the BIS uh, report this year actually suggests that some 86 percent of central banks uh, in the world are already uh, researching or you, you know uh, and seriously or actively researching uh, um, digital currency and, and uh, mainly the the uh, the retail the the, the sort of uh, uh, central bank backed uh, uh, retail uh, I think initiative is the one that uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more right so uh, we ultimately hope that this will become the safest uh, form of uh, money. That's uh, that that is certainly the intended consequence, I would say. Right. Next slide, please. Right now, um, we talked about some of the issues in terms of anonymity, traceability, uh, and of course, oversight, uh, identification, verification type of issues. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you some examples. Uh, you know where certain countries are trying certain approaches as we speak now. Now, if, if we look at KYC approaches, right, how do we conduct identification and verification to reduce uh, the risk of anonymity? Um, now, account-based uh, tokens, uh, of course, uh, when we looked at, uh, uh, you, you know, whether we go the account-based ba account way or token-based uh, approach, uh, the key thing is always to remove that uh, anonymity issue, right? The identification requirements uh, are, are important, right? Now, so that's uh, one way to address the risk, certainly. And, and the example here that we have is uh, People's Bank of China and the National Bank of Cambodia uh, that, uh, you know, they have different approaches. Uh, now, China has gone the account-based approach way and uh, uh, Cambodia is looking at token-based uh, approach way. Uh, but again, uh, ultimately the, uh, the controls that are being put in place by Cambodia, as you can see from here, is uh, uh, limiting the transfer amount, right? So that's one form of control. If, uh, you know, to a certain extent, it's like a, a, a prepaid card uh, payment today where uh, the, the well-known control is, uh, 
is the uh, threshold limits that are imposed uh, on such transactions simply because you know it is uh, uh, still anonymous. Uh, it can change hands easily, right? The, the traceability is not necessarily that easy. So the way the government here, at least in Cambodia, is thinking about it is through uh, threshold, right? Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, China is going the account-based approach way, which is possibly what we you know uh, uh, a very sound uh, approach in terms of creating a record for every single account holder, right? Uh, so these are the two uh, approaches that uh, we. Uh, we can share for today we've seen, right, as far as uh, uh, anonymity is concerned, right? Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, for uh, standards for interoperability, I think this one, again, uh, requires a lot of thinking uh, through harmonizing legal frameworks globally, right? So um, I guess the, uh, uh, the, the, these are broader, broader than AML questions, certainly. Uh, but what happens with this is that, of course, we want to achieve interoperability, but with, with, with this also, uh, it, it means that uh, the harmonization of cross-border standards has to be there. Uh, and the, the fact that transactions can move faster uh, with, inter uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, digital tokens also becoming legal tender, uh, you know, uh, for the purposes of uh, making payments and operating uh, in, in, in a you know, sort of a seamless world, then uh, we also need to ensure that right controls are in place, right? So if you look at the Nordic approach, the Nordic P27, uh, which is a pan uh, Nordic initiative, they're looking at uh, uh, digitizing domestic and cross-border payments. And of course, uh, it, it's likely to also, uh, one of the things that they're considering is also to ensure that you know the standards can be harmonized right so we we create uh, uh similar standards across uh, different countries that are accepting uh digital payments uh, and that i think is critical for the success of uh, cross-border payments uh right and of course uh national bank of cambodia again is uh, uh an, an example where they're also trying similar initiative across neighboring countries for the movement of funds um it will allow customers to transfer funds uh, from Malaysia to Cambodia as a start, I think, and ultimately it will be bilateral for both countries. Uh, but I, I think that for, for uh, cross-border payments, monitoring is, a, is an important, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is an important perspective. Uh, and now that is still uh, something that we don't know enough about of how governments eventually are going to agree on making sure that there's sufficient uh, monitoring of the flow of funds, flow of payments, uh, the cross-border flow of funds. That will be an interesting, uh, you know, something that in, in, in an interesting development to look at, um, you know, and I think there, uh, what will not work, what will certainly not work is that if we are just looking at uh, where we permit these transactions to be cross-border, but we are looking at it uh, in the monitoring capability uh, does not um, uh, factor in that seamless uh, or, or that that uh, you know information that that uh, which is cross-border information. I'm talking about transactions here. Uh, in order for any form of monitoring to be successful, uh, it will be interesting to look at how governments are going to agree on. Uh, the sort of bilateral sharing of information and making available information on, uh, you know, how the, uh, what sort of uh, uh, change of hands we're looking at and whether that in itself uh, suggests any form of anomaly in the transaction itself, right? So uh, the, the fact that transactions can move cross-border and can move uh, rather quickly uh, also, uh, you know, creates a lot of, uh, uh, I think uh, or, or requires a lot of thinking through and how monitoring can be uh, put in place, right? Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, uh, slide, please. Right, some of the uh, 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 the other, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, reduction of burden. One of the things that we looked at was efficient monitoring uh, for customer activities. Right? And I, I think I talked a little bit about that uh, with the cross-border uh, payments uh, that certain countries are looking at, uh, but it also, you know, I, I 
personally think uh, as a practitioner that we have, uh, with, uh, with digital uh, token or di rather digital currency, the potential to reduce uh, the current compliance burden uh, is certainly um, you know, something that, that may eventually uh, happen, right? Uh, simply because uh, if we go by the account uh, approach, then uh, we eliminate a lot of the anonymity issues uh, as well as create a lot more traceability. So those two are really fundamental uh, principles to work with, which will allow better monitoring. And now um, at a national level, it's always uh, easier to do things, it's easier to monitor things. But like I said in the earlier slide, the, there are broader and bigger issues uh, to address when it comes to cross-border uh, transactions, right? Uh, but I, I guess to the extent that we're looking at it from national level, and if we do choose the uh, account approach, a lot of these issues are, uh, you know, are easier to address, right? So uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, uh, and, and you know, they are certainly looking at uh, uh, how they could uh, monitor uh, anonymized transaction uh, while uh, at the same time, uh, allowing financial institutions that are registered to observe, uh, you know, the transactions and also understanding the parties that are involved in the transaction, right? So that's one approach that, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, where where some attention is being paid to monitoring in order to really understand if there are any illicit inf uh, activities uh, or anomalous transactions that require further action, right? And uh, Central Bank of Bahamas as well, the project sand uh, dollar uh, is, uh, uh, and this is an interesting one because uh, what they're trying to do is use a centralized KYC register uh, to, to maintain KYC information, right? And I do think that, um, you know, slightly different for countries uh, within, within our region as well. If you look at, you know, Singapore, for example, we already have uh, national identity uh, system, but for countries that don't have that, if we're going the digital currency way, then national identity uh, information and certainly digitizing that is uh, is is uh, is going to be useful, right? It, it's something that will have to be uh, thought through by governments. And here, as you can see, uh, in Bahamas, they're already looking at the centralized KYC register, uh, which uh, you know, which I think uh, certainly helps with the um, you know creating the uh, 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 removing the anonymity issue at one and uh, creating uh, that level of traceability, right? That is essential. All right, we'll move on to the next slide, please. Right, okay. So here, uh, you know, I'm going to get into talking about the AML CFT framework. And, and I do caution that this is the standard AML CFT framework that we typically look at today, right? Uh, but what we've done is that we will share with you certain principles that will be useful for uh, digital currency, uh, but we cannot run away from the, you know, sort of the standard AML CFT principles and the typical framework that we look at when we are trying to address financial crime related risks, right? Uh, so we'll talk about, you know, governance oversight, et cetera, right? Uh, and like I said, you know, that this is interesting uh, as we move along to really understand ultimately whose responsibility is this going to be? Uh, because we, we know that banks will continue, uh, the supervised uh, entities, the regulated ent entities will continue with their AML CFT regime uh, and uh, some level of uh, ease in monitoring transactions, monitoring payments, uh, the individuals that are involved, uh, we will see over time. But I think ultimately the strength is always in the uh, in a good framework, uh, and we I think also need to eventually understand uh, the the national level commitment, right? That the standards are seamless between the uh, the central bank, the issuer of the currency, as well as the industry, um, and um, the the principles for identification and verification. Um, uh, are something that we focus a lot on. And the reason I say this is because even today, for countries where we have a high bar of uh, regulatory compliance expectations, where we've already established uh, ID and V or, or you know, KYC principles that are uh, internationally uh, you know, benchmarked, we still have issues, right? We, we still have issues with the traditional 
uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, banking framework, uh, a, a compliance framework. If you look at uh, look look at today, now uh, when we conduct, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do across the industry, we we still continue to see issues with social wealth, issues with uh, with uh, I, uh, you know, with KYC. So my my question really is that. Uh, it's not so much about just creating that traceability and removing anonymity, but it's also ensuring that uh, I, the principles of identification and verification, uh, you know, uh, are not relaxed, right? We continue to up our game uh, in that uh, aspect, right? Because nothing should really change uh, with someone uh, eventually going down uh, owning digital currency. Right, so that I think uh, is a core principle that we we will always need to adhere to and maintain. Right? Can we move on to the next slide, please, Nishi? Thank you. Right. So some core principles here. Uh, you know, we'll talk about governance and oversight. Uh, we'll talk about uh, CDD, customer due diligence. Right. We'll talk about monitoring and, uh, of course, other risks like uh, terrorist financing, uh, proliferation financing, and sanctions. Okay, so we'll move on. Yeah. Okay. So the implication really, if you look at it from um, AML CFD perspective, uh, and we talked a lot of, uh, about this uh, already, it's uh, inadequate uh, uh, assessment of uh, risks, money laundering, terrorist financing, proliferation financing risks. Um, these risks will remain, right? They're not going to go away. Um, now, if we use, uh, you know, where the, the 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 potential of transactions to happen even faster, because everything is on a, a distributed ledger or blockchain or whatever form, uh, you know, of uh, technology that is eventually, uh, you know, that eventually is going to work. Uh, the the um, the fact that we will be subject to financial crime related risk doesn't go away. So what does that really mean? Is that we need good controls in place. Uh, nonetheless, right? Even if we uh, ultimately have certain benefits arising out of uh, going uh, and, em uh, and embracing digital currencies, right? Uh, now, the, the other uh, issue is also again undefined roles and responsibilities, as we have on the slide here, is really about uh, you know the, um, the 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 overall framework in terms of you know third party providers the. Uh, bank the whole ecosystem to work together, uh, as well as regulators, enforcement agencies, the central bank, which is the issue of the currency, right? So I think it is ultimately collective responsibility. Uh, now, when we talk about controls, I, I think that we, we still can't run away from the fact that we do need a good framework, good financial crime compliance framework within respective uh, organizations, right? And, and how they apply in terms of monitoring uh, the the uh, their customers uh, whether they hold uh, you know digital currency or not uh, that that principle is something that will remain yeah okay we'll move on to the next slide all right so now uh, in terms of customer due diligence uh, a lot a lot has been said we did talk uh, uh, quite a bit about about it uh, one of the key issues uh, or uh, risks that you know, that come to mind is about data security, right? So there could be greater uh, identity uh, uh, theft, fraud, uh, you know, as, as we go uh, uh, towards uh, sort of digital onboarding, uh, if, if that's something that we're looking at, uh, and if there, and also being subject to cyber risks, right? That's something that we can't run away from. Uh, there will always be, um, sophisticated criminals who will try to game the system, right? And I think that therefore, um, you know, the whole element of uh, cyber risk, the digital or, or, or identity fraud is something that we will need to pay attention to. Uh, as, at the same time, uh, we talked about uh, anonymity earlier. Uh, now, depending on the model, eventually, uh, uh, or the multiple different models that could operate globally, uh, I, uh, you know, whilst we are, uh, looking at financial inclu inclusion for a number of countries, you know, in order to ensure that the unbanked customers are ultimately all, uh, you know, uh, banked and digital currency does uh, seem to promise to solve that problem, but the due diligence requirements are, uh, you know, cannot be relaxed, right? But I think here also lies 
a policy issue for a number of countries where if you're dealing with remote uh, and retail uh, individuals, right, retail customers, where, uh, uh, you know, the uh, amounts that you're talking about are small, uh, then, you know, I think the regulatory bal uh, the burden balance needs to be achieved, right? Because the standards uh, of KYC uh, are extremely high and, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, small amounts of retail, uh, you know, transactions, uh, the uh, the cost and benefit analysis will have to, will, will, will automatically be considered by 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 uh, regulators and central banks, right? So that uh, you know, I guess is is uh, uh, is is something that we probably don't have an answer to today. But um, a lot of it can still be you know solved by certain controls in place. For example, digital onboarding, where controls are built into uh, the the uh, within the technology itself, and that technology exists today. It's not new to anyone. Uh, uh, and, and it does have safeguards in place that are quite reliable, right? So, so that's possibly one approach. Uh, uh, one approach, uh, the national utility or identity or the national uh, uh, identity system is the other one that hopefully will solve uh, some of these issues. Uh, um, and at the same time, uh, like we spoke about earlier, the, the gatekeeping uh, uh, function, which is really KYC, uh, still needs to be uh, robust, right? Uh, and you know, here one of the things that we talked about uh, as controls is also tiered uh, CDD, right? Uh, looking at it from risk-based perspective, the the higher the risk, uh, the possibly the uh, you you know that again when we say uh, risk-based approach and the higher the risk, the the higher the KYC standard, uh, you know that also has to be ultimately defined, right? Because sometimes. Uh, even small amounts, uh, especially with terrorist financing, uh, where there, there is no single uh, typology that we are really looking at, there could be many different ways of uh, um, furthering that activity, even small amounts sometimes are uh, not free of risk, right? So therefore, uh, the need to really define uh, risk uh, when it comes to uh, looking at customers uh, in this, uh, in this, within this framework, right? Um, and at, at the other thing is, again, you know, we talked quite a bit about this and I uh, mentioned earlier as well, the whole standardization, right, of, uh, um, of uh, the, the sort of regulatory expectations and requirements, you know, uh, and how they also apply to uh, ecosystem, uh, the players within the ecosystem, right, uh, you know, from financial institutions, uh, entities that eventually will offer uh, transfer of funds or, or the uh, digital currency, um, the custo uh, the those that uh, have the custodial, uh, you know, services, whether this is a bank opening the account or you know any form of uh, 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 custodial services that may uh, eventually come into play, right? So making sure that there is the uh, the, the the right balance is achieved across the system. And the burden is not one which is unfairly imposed only on financial institutions or banks that are that are holding uh, these accounts. Right. We'll move on to the next slide, please. Nishi. Yeah. And uh, now here uh, we will talk a little bit about transactions monitoring. Um, the potential risks with uh, with CBDC still, you know, uh, transaction wise and payment wise will still continue to exist. Uh, and of course, there could be different. You know, we we could like like we do today, right? It's no different that we could have, uh, you know, issues in detecting anomalous transactions, uh, and there could be certain intricate uh, schemes ultimately. Uh, and new uh, new threats that will emerge, new typologies that will em emerge as they have been all these years. Uh, you know, and here are some examples where we talk. You know, where where we're highlighting here that some some issues could be uh, microtransactions for structuring, right? Uh, using multiple wallets uh, uh, to front uh, criminal activity, right? And also commingling uh, of uh, clean and tainted. Uh, car uh, uh, digital currencies, right, which is uh, not uncommon today when, within the construct that we, that that uh, that payments and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, bank accounts uh, today operate, right. So it, it's not very different, and we will still need to continue to understand the 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 
potential financial crime threats, as well as the emerging typologies uh, along the way, right? Now, uh, some of the controls that uh, you know, we can consider are to look at the existing AML CFT systems so that they remain sufficient, but I do think that we will need to optimize them uh, because consumer behavior, as you know, uh, as we go more and more digital, and today we're not even talking uh, about uh, digital currencies, but even in, in the current construct post uh, the pandemic, the, the consumer behavior has changed. As we go more digital, we do more online uh, payments, online shopping, and not all transactions are, are uh, financial crime, are tainted with financial crime. But having said that, you know, there's a lot of volume uh, that banks are subject to where you're really looking for the needle in the haystack, right? And therefore, uh, the need for systems to also uh, adjust accordingly, to be optimized accordingly. And here again, I would always call out that one of the things that we should always, we should strive uh, globally to think about is national level utilities uh, for the purposes of uh, monitoring transactions. And especially when we go the digital way, um, simply because the vantage point that we have when we look at uh, uh, you know, utilities at national level, we look at transactional data at national level, we look at payment data at, at national level, we see we should potentially, and we've, uh, you know, we've had certain successes in some countries where we see a lot more uh, when we go uh, towards that national level monitoring utilities, right? So that, uh, you know, I would, I would think that should be on the cards that, uh, you know, governments should consider and policymakers should consider. Uh, because I, I do think that the, uh, the, if the burden remains on financial institutions alone, uh, one, it's, uh, you know, we, we tend to continue to, you know, that the regulatory burden continue to increase there. Uh, but at the same time, we're dealing with limited amount of data and information because the only, a financial institution only would see what they can see within their uh, infrastructure, right? So that's one, uh, certainly for discussion. And of course, like I said earlier, new typologies, right? They will continue new threats. New typologies will, will continue to, uh, you know, to evolve. Uh, and, you know, as you know, that many financial institutions today are already um, deploying the use of AI and machine learning for monitoring purposes, uh, simply because we, we learn from the data and we are, you know, and it gives us the opportunity to understand not current, not only current anomalies, but also future uh, threats and emerging threats, right? So, so certainly uh, we, we need to innovate in the way we undertake monitoring and we continue to do so we should continue to do so with the digital currencies uh, as well as they come uh, our way. We'll move on, please, to the next slide. Right, so here, uh, terrorist financing, uh, proliferation financing uh, uh, related issues. Now, some of the risks, uh, you know, and I did mention this regulatory arbitrage is always a key issue. Right, it's uh, not just for uh, terrorist financing and proliferation financing, but across the financial crime uh, framework. But more so when it comes to uh, you know sanctions, uh, uh, etc. Right, more so uh, regulatory arbitrage becomes a problem even in the framework that we exist in today. Right uh, now, if CDs, we, uh, C CBDCs continue to be built um, at uh, what we call the national silos. Uh, you know, what we don't want is uh, uh, sanctioned countries to bypass restrictions and then target the weak links within the, the system, right? So that is, uh, is uh, always an issue. Uh, so therefore, that, that regulatory harmonization is important where we, you know, we pay um, uh, or we embrace uh, the standards when it comes to monitoring terrorist financing, proliferation financing, uh, uh, as well as sanction, and particularly the uh, the way we enforce uh, sanctions, uh, the way we, uh, we 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 adhere to sanctions uh, requirements, right? That becomes uh, a lot more important as we move forward. Um, also, the anonymity in cross border transactions. We talked about that earlier. Uh, now, the peer to peer transaction remains uh, an area of. Uh, 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 a risk uh, that may uh, and where we what we do like to achieve there is uh, ensuring that there's uh, uh, you know appropriate payment uh, filtering and uh, or payment screening uh, that should be performed uh, on counterparties right 
if, if uh, uh, again, uh, uh, now screening is not the answer to everything, but that's one way to manage uh, a risk and ensure that we put in the right controls in place, right? So some of the proposed controls here, as you can see, one is transparency, which requires coordination, cross-border coordination between governments, between central banks, between regulators, between enforcement agencies, uh, in order to uh, you, you know, address uh, sanction-related uh, issues, any uh, uh, anomalies that can be potential risks. I, I think that, again, uh, you know, and I think transparency is a big, it's in, in this context, uh, what does transparency mean? It's not just about sharing of information, uh, or I'd say one thing is uh, sharing of information. The other thing is uh, also uh, proactive uh, surveillance because um, where where uh, it, where where we ha we have the legal construct to share information, with, to share typologies, to share uh, anomalies that are being seen, uh, you know, in one jurisdiction with the other, and 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 in the same way being shared with financial institutions so that they are aware, right? So it's it's not just always bottom up from financial institutions going up to enforcement agencies, but as you know, it's really important. And I think increasingly we're also seeing the other way around where enforcement agencies, FIUs are sharing that information with the industry. I think that needs, that framework should, uh, you know, continue to evolve and be enhanced, right? Because that's really, um, it's really about a collective uh, effort to, uh, deal with uh, sanctions related issues, especially with cross-border uh, payments, right? And um, programmability here, you know, what we're really saying here is that, uh, you know, because uh, CBDCs can be designed to uh, prevent uh, um, uh, wallets that have uh, you know, basically, you know, to, to uh, again, uh, the, the issue is really about sanctions related risk, right? And, and the programs uh, on sanctions compliance. So ultimately the program has to be harmonized. It has to be designed in such a way that, uh, you know, we can uh, prevent wallets from, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, there can be preventative measures, right? It's, it's certainly, uh, you know, requires a lot of work, but, uh, you know, it, it should prevent wallets from making uh, you know, from facilitating uh, payments in, for the purposes of terrorist financing, proliferation financing, or uh, or sanctions or contravening uh, sanctions requirements, right? So that's really uh, again, it it means uh, that we need to harmonize the standards. We need to make sure that there is uh, a proper uh, framework around monitoring. Uh, at the same time, that level of transparency that we're looking for should be there, right? Uh, and also limiting any anonymous transaction. In fact, you know, preventing anonymous uh, transaction is, is certainly important for uh, the, uh, the framework, the, 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 the whole uh, uh, payment framework from not becoming a weak link, right? It, 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 you know, any good, uh, 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 you know, sort of ultimately the, a good objective that we, you know, or good outcome rather we want to achieve is to make sure that we are, uh, there are no weak links within the system across, uh, you know, across the industry or also across. Oh, Radish, I think you have muted yourself. Oops, sorry about that. Thank you for that nice thing. All right, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, it looks like, um, you know, we, we've come to uh, end of the session and to Q&A. And I think that's why I unknowingly and inadvertently muted myself because it was time for me to keep quiet and, you know, let everybody else ask questions. Uh, so back to you, uh, Alwinda, maybe you want to uh, just address everybody here? Uh, sure, thanks, uh, Radish. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a lot of information in an hour, I must say. I was glued to my screen and listening to you. Uh, intently, not a new topic to me uh, personally, but but still uh, plenty to learn in this uh, exciting field, especially how CBDC interacts. Uh, in terms of because we are conducting this in a in a webinar format, for those who have questions uh, that you want addressed here, uh, why not uh, just type it in the chat and I I can communicate it. Alternatively, uh, yeah, so that actually that is the only option we have. Now, uh, maybe I will start. 
with the opening slides, uh, you had uh, one of the things you talked about uh, is actually the shift in responsibility or at least the perceived shift in responsibility because of uh, CBDCs where the central bank may now or the issuer of currency may now start to play a role in uh, AML CFT. Now, traditionally, and uh, this is uh, speaking from just uh, the MAS point of view, uh, the, uh, we, we play the second line of defense. And uh, over the years, we have up, uh, we have developed tools, we have uh, bought tools, and uh, we have uh, tightened our processes to actually uh, further refine the way we conduct AML CFT. But the primary responsibility of this is still on the intermediaries that we supervise uh, in most cases. So, uh, and hence we supervise those who are super, those, yeah, uh, you know what I mean. But now with CBDCs and all that things, that may shift. And uh, I also take reference on what Hong Kong released recently. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, uh, where Hong Kong talked about two-tier model. This is a technical paper. It doesn't suggest the HKMA will do, do it this way. But I, I mean, a publication from a central bank is often taken seriously as, as a decision point uh, in, in, in many cases. And so Hong Kong has decided that, hey, even this shift to a central bank taking on more responsibility for uh, AML CFT, uh, it's actually a very difficult uh, shift to make uh, uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, so, so maybe I, my, my question is a broad one, and we can actually take this to the next hour as well. What are your views on this? Do you think that this shift is going to happen? And uh, how, will, how will central banks react to it? And, and what is the impact on, on the man on the street and so on and so forth? No, thanks for that question, Alvin. And I think, uh, you know, I, I read the Hong Kong uh, uh, paper, very interesting, I must say. Um, and, and, you know, as I start the, started the conversation uh, earlier, one of the things I mentioned was that it's interesting to see how central banks will react to this as the burden would shift to them, right? Now, um, I, I myself being an ex-regulator, you know, I can certainly understand this from policy you know, perspective. One is policy. One is also the the, the sort of that um, construct that we've been dealing with for years and years of how you know uh, uh, supervisory agencies or central banks uh, that have supervisory you know functions um, typically are uh, you, you know sort of the oversight authority, if you like, right? So you're monitoring others. Uh, but when you know when the burden would shift eventually, and and if it does go that way. Um, the, the question I have, uh, well, not I, well, I, I'd say the question that needs to be addressed is that, um, you know, how will central banks be supervised? Who will supervise them? Who would audit them? And who would say that your AML CFT controls or your AML CFT framework, insofar as a digital currency is concerned, uh, is sufficient or insufficient, right? I think that's interesting. I don't have the answer to that today. Right uh, now, that is something that is a framework that has to be thought through. Uh, the other thing is also that if uh, if if and when this burden does shift, and my personal opinion is, and this is my personal opinion, please, uh, you know, do not take this to be a Deloitte opinion. Uh, my personal opinion is that the burden should shift. Right, it's about time. Um, uh, you know, and let me open that up for some heated debate. I do like to hear uh, other views. The, the other issue is one, you know, one issue is, uh, you know, about supervising uh, the supervisor and the other, the other thing is opening them up to regulatory risk, right? If there are failures, if there are weaknesses in the framework, then how is that dealt with, right? What's the legal framework um, do, do, do we, you know, uh, do we use uh, in order to address that? And the third issue is that what does it then do to public confidence? What does it then do to um, you know, if there are weaknesses that are seen right at the at the sort of the central bank level, then what does it do uh, uh, to the public confidence that's holding on to digital currency? So I think these are some of the things broadly that need to be thought through, right? Uh, and eventually, I do think that uh, the 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 balance of the burden, you know, uh, has to be introduced, right? We cannot continue to just say that financial institutions alone and alone are responsible for. Uh, AML CFT related risk, right? But but I do recognize that there'll be a lot of uh, uh, legal regulatory challenges, um, risk ownership issues, uh, and so on and so forth. Like I mean, what I talked about, you know. But uh, but hey, you know, I think uh, I'd, I'd also open it up to others to to uh, opine on this. And I, you know, nice thing. I don't know if you have a view, uh, being an ex regulator yourself. What you know, if you like to comment on this. 
Uh, thanks very much, Radish. Um, obviously, I, I am not an AML professional, so I, I don't have a view from that perspective. Um, but being trained as an economist, I guess one consideration would be who has the comparative advantage in uh, conducting the KYC and you know, the necessary transaction monitoring and so forth. And um, there could be arguments, right, that um, the central bank having access to um, all the records uh, coming from all the regulated uh, institutions uh, would actually have an advantage over uh, individual institutions trying to do that work on their own based on partial information. So that's one possible perspective. But then similarly applying sort of the economist perspective, um, we have also to consider uh, how would this then change incentive structures within the financial system? And um, would that lead to sort of in um, sort of, I guess, uh, unintended consequences in terms of intermediaries um, taking excessive risk uh, in terms of onboarding customers and, and, and undertaking various transactions uh, that may actually uh, lead to an increase right, in AML CFT risk. So I, I think um, very difficult question that Alvinda has raised uh, and no simple answers. I, I think this uh, shift in possible shift Right, and uh, responsibility or, or uh, ownership of um, KYC and um, overall uh, responsibility for AML CFT risk uh, would, would be something that uh, needs to be really thought through very carefully. Got it. Uh, thank you, Daiseng. Thank you, Reddish. Now, uh, it's just some Q&A that came in on the chat function here. And again, for those who want something more interactive, we will have the next hour to speak about this and unpack this. But just a Q&A from James here. Uh, just a question from James, actually. Can you say more about how banks in a two-tier system, so I think it's the reference to Hong Kong model or, or, the, or what you described earlier as well, will be able to use the same KYC AML system? That means not changing, I, I think the genesis of the question is not changing their current uh, mode of operations, but, but, uh, but uh, allowing it to function in the two-tier system. Uh, would you have any views on this? No. Um, that, that's a, that, you know, I, th I think that's a great question, but also a difficult one at the same time, right? Uh, now, can we use the existing uh, framework? Uh, I guess in terms of, if we go by the principle of it, yes, we, we should be able to use the same uh, framework, but with some level of uh, you know adjustments as may be required, right? Now, um, I, I, I think the, the, the key is about uh, understanding the, the risks, right? Uh, what what really changes uh, is the fact that you know if we can say that we, with the two tier model, in one of them there is a, a, you know lack of uh, let's say for example there, there's uh, no risk of anonymity there's no uh, you know sort of lack of uh, there's no risk of audit trail then then we can use a, a slightly different standard of monitoring because the risks are lower. Uh, you know that that is one approach, but you know I I I simply feel that we don't know enough today, right? Um, and I and I and I want to be uh, a little bit cautious as well at this stage to say that you know we can uh, lower the standard for one or the other. And I, I you know I I don't I today I don't foresee that, right? Um, what I would still say is that the KYC standards don't change, right? Because when you identify your customer, it really uh, you know, uh, doesn't matter at that point because you need to verify and identify your customer that the customer itself is um, whiter than white, as it were, right? Uh, there are no financial crime related risks associated with the customer. The source of uh, funds and wealth is, is applicable. Now, again, I'm, we're talking retail here uh, and we don't necessarily need to, you know, consider the private bank uh, type of standards, but, you know, generally speaking, that level of scrutiny is still required. So that doesn't change, right? Uh, but what may eventually change is that if, if we're going by the account-based uh, approach, then, uh, you know, the audit trail traceability uh, becomes easier, right? Anonymity uh, obviously is not the issue, but I, I would still say that KYC remains the same, right? Uh, in so far as monitoring of transaction, because ongoing monitoring is an obligation that is not going to go away, right? Because if uh, you know if customers are trying to reverse engineer uh, into the system, right? 
where they appear to be absolutely clean at the point of onboarding, but later on, you know, are, are showing signs of potentially demonstrating that there could be some financial crime or, or money laundering happening later on. The ongoing monitoring obligation doesn't change either. So, you know, I, I do think that this is something that we need to drill deeper into, and I don't think I personally would have the answer today, really, right? Uh, no, uh, Radish, actually, I, I totally agree with you. I, I just don't think the fundamentals will change as much. I think we are building things differently uh, using different tech stacks and all, but uh, sorry, are you speaking? Because uh, I, I see your lips moving and <laughs> Radish, are you speaking? Sorry, I'm having so much of uh, some technology. No, I said I totally agree, agree with that. the fundamentals don't uh, change significantly. All right. I uh, know. Uh, thanks. I, I think we have time for just one more question. And I, I was looking at the chat again, and there's an interesting question that came up. Where the current standards, uh, FEDA standards, are not as effective in tackling terrorism financing, and the CBDC framework uh, could be effective if uh, the global policy on terrorism financing was much more stringent uh, than current standards. But the author of the question also acknowledges that uh, it's this kind of consensus building is tough. And so hence, the, the question is, well, this means that CBDC or the use of it is relegated to intra-border. So I think in this case here, the author means just a closed loop system uh, within say wholesale, with, within banks or within just trusted entities and will not be as widespread. So uh, just, just based on the limitations of uh, the FedEx standards and so on and so forth, what are your views on it? I'm just trying to understand the question. Are we saying that, and help me through this, are we saying that, uh, that CBDC the, the, the CBDC framework can be an effective way to, to address uh, terrorist financing related risk? Is that what I, I, I think that's what the author is saying. The CBDC framework can be effective if there is also a concerted effort to actually improve uh, the policy on terrorism financing and all. And therefore, because of, and he, he acknowledges, I, I'm, I'm not sure the gender, the individual acknowledges that this kind of consensus could be difficult. And hence, uh, his, his or her question is, does this mean only intra-border uh, transactions will be will will, will be uh, 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 CBDC will only start with this? You know, um, I think one of the the slides earlier we did talk about terrorist financing, proliferation finance, financing, and sanctions. Right. One of the key things is also to achieve that that uh, uh, cross-border. Uh, you know, harmonization, right? Because everyone then needs to give effect to uh, sanctions requirements, uh, uh, PFTF requirements equally, right? At the same standard. Now, that that is the only way uh, I would imagine, right? One is that, and two, of course, is if the risk appetite of the financial institution itself is, uh, is set at a level where uh, monitoring is going to be stringent, right? Uh, the manner in which you, you look at, uh, you, you know, certain, uh, uh, obviously certain risks, uh, you know, or, or where you have a heightened, uh, uh, you know, uh, risk-based approach to it, then then so be it, right? I think that's out, that doesn't change, right? But yes, the cross-border uh, harmonization is important. I think today the key issue, as you would see with this, is really where uh, there are certain, um, uh, you know, standard setting agencies uh, have, uh, certainly come up with certain standards and some countries the developed world is a lot more uh, you know receptive to these standards right but then you also have uh, issues within the global framework where there still are weak links right where, where there's lack of enforcement there's lack of uh, or, or timeliness to imbibe you know these standards so to the extent that we eliminate that and we achieve that global harmonization we, we're going to continue to have these issues right Oh, sorry, yeah, got you it. Done, <laughs> you done a ready uh, by me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens uh, to the best of us. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I, and I think this harmonization of standards uh, is actually absolutely crucial and also one of the most difficult tasks, uh, which takes us to almost the top of the hour. And for the those of us who are part of the, 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 the challenge, uh, we move on to the round table in, in, in another link. And so I will see you guys there and uh, yeah, and where we can have a more vibrant discussion in a different setting. See you guys. Thank you and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you.